Today, the surgical removal of a tumor is widely accepted as beneficial and necessary. Yet it was not long ago that the prevailing public attitude towards tumor resection and other cancer treatments used today were so disapproving and hostile that it can be difficult for people to imagine. The great 15th century Renaissance physician Paracelsus once wrote, it should be forbidden and severely punished to remove cancer by cutting, burning, cautery, and other fiendish tortures. All right, so this presentation is called The Shocking History of Cancer Surgery. Let's get started. I made a timeline here from the year 1500 all the way to present day. How did we go from people being completely disapproving and hostile towards cancer surgery to today where it's accepted as normal? Everyone knows if you got a tumor, you got to cut that thing out. In my estimation, what happened were two things. Number one, the loss of common sense. And number two, a lack of knowledge, mainly of history, about the medical industry. In fact, if you graphed the common sense from the year 1500 to today, uh, I estimate it would look a lot like this, which is a steady decline all the way down to zero to present day. Let me ask you something to try to bring back common sense. When was the last time you were cut with a knife and it made you healthier? I'll tell you the last time I was cut with a knife. It was a few years ago. I accidentally cut my finger while trying to pry apart two frozen chicken breasts with a kitchen knife for dinner. Horrible idea, I know. Anyway, the knife ended up slicing into my finger, causing some bleeding and leaving a piece of skin hanging off. I thought I might have needed stitches, so I went to the hospital and ended up sitting in the waiting room for four hours, thanks to Canada's horrendous socialist medical system. When I finally received medical attention, all they did was give me a band-aid for my finger and send me on my way. Waste of time. Anyway, my point is, after the knife cut me, I was in much worse health. I was bleeding. Uh, it scabbed up over the next couple weeks, and I kept cracking the scabs. It was painful. It was inflamed, and I couldn't do as many things as I normally would with my hands. You know, when you can't use your hands in the same way. So why do we assume that a person with cancer, a sick person, getting cut with a knife, it's going to make them healthier? It's like everyone knows if somebody approaches you in the street with a knife and asks for your wallet, and they stab you with that thing, if you don't give them your wallet and they stab you, you, you could die. And that's you as a healthy person. But a sick person with cancer, all of a sudden you get someone called a doctor in a teal scrub outfit with a fancy little hat asking you for your wallet to cut you, and you give it over to them and you say, yeah, please cut me. Well, a sick person getting cut with a knife, does that really sound like a good idea? Reason number two why people are so accepting of cancer surgery today complete lack of knowledge, mainly of history. For instance, did you know in the 1960s, a surgeon named Walter Freeman crisscrossed the United States performing an, a procedure called the ice pick lobotomy on mental health patients in what he called the lobotomobile, which is an RV with the words lobotomobile on the side. The ice pick lobotomy is a procedure in which an ice pick like instrument is inserted underneath the orbital bone just above the eyeball and in a quick scrambling motion, tissues in the prefrontal lobes of the brain are severed. Finally, in 1967, after performing 50,000 lobotomies and causing a brain hemorrhage that ended up killing a patient, the egomaniac butcher Freeman was banned from performing the procedure. Here's another piece of history that you probably have no idea about. The history of cancer surgery. The rapid rise of cancer surgery is best illustrated by the early history of what is now Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. This according to Dr. Ralph Moss in his book, The Cancer Industry. The spiritual founder of Memorial Sloan Kettering was famous 19th century women's doctor, in quotes, J. Marion Sims. Sims received only a brief medical training before turning his hand to surgery. Looking to extend the boundaries of surgery, Sims gathered a group of slaves upon whom he performed experimental operations in a kind of makeshift hospital behind his house. Some of these women received as many as 30 operations in a four-year period. According to his sympathetic biographer, these operations were said to be little short of murderous. 
And here we have a picture of J. Marion Sims on the screen. The Madman. And what is that hanging from his jacket? A Maltese cross? Is that a symbol for the Knights Templar? That brooch? I'll let you come to your own conclusions about that. Anyway, I looked online when I was researching him. And it turns out within the past few years, maybe a few years ago, there was some protests. They actually had the audacity, the arrogance, to erect a statue of J. Marion Sims after he died. And that was done many years ago, but there were people protesting in front of it mainly black women, saying that this man experimented on slaves, which he did, but I don't think it was racially motivated or driven. This guy didn't care who he cut. He just wanted someone to cut. Because as we see here, Sims then moved to New York City, where he founded the Women's Hospital, which still exists to this day. He continued performing surgeries on large numbers of women, many of whom were recent European immigrants, and he even developed a select clientele of wealthy ladies. According to Moss, the lady managers or the trustees of the hospital became convinced that the lives of all the patients in the institution were being threatened by mysterious experiments. Sims was expelled from the hospital but was later reinstated to his position. In 1884, Sims went on to establish the first private cancer hospital in the United States, the New York Cancer Hospital, known today as the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Sims was to become the first director of the hospital, but died before he had a chance to fulfill his goal. Thank God for that. Now, is it surprising, seeing some of these historical things, the lobotomy done on people by Freeman and his lobotomobile as recently as 1967, and this history of the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, that modern medicine is the number one cause of death? Is it surprising? No, it's not. And according to Dr. Richard Ablin, public enemy number one is the profit before patient ethos of the medical industry. The industry puts profit before healing patients. So it's like if they heal someone with any kind of medical intervention, the drugs or surgeries of which modern medicine is comprised, you know, that's fine. But that's not their goal. Their only goal is to make money. That's their number one obligation. They've got shareholders, they've got investors, and they need to appease them. And so according to Dr. Richard Ablin in that quote, it's the system itself that's causing this problem. So let's look a little deeper at this ethos that he speaks of. The profit before patient ethos. So we're going to look right now at some common facts, three common facts and the implications of those facts. So from these simple facts, this is where we derive our common sense. So number one, a surgeon gets paid to cut people. First of all, think about that. Let that soak in. That's a terrifying fact. If he doesn't perform any surgeries, he can't pay the bills. And the implications of that simple fact is you cannot trust a surgeon. Surgeons have families, they have bills to pay. What if they overspent and bought a Ferrari and have to pay the bill on that thing or they lose it? What if they have to pay the mortgage on their third cottage they just bought in the tropics? Or more humbly, like many doctors, they have families to take care of. What if they're trying to put their children through college or university and they need to quickly save up the money to pay for that? And on that same line of thought, the more procedures a surgeon performs, the more money she makes. That's how the system has it set up. So do you think that based on that, maybe they might perform a little more surgeries than they have to? Do you think they might err on the side of caution with somebody who may not need a surgery and say, yeah, you, you probably need this. Let's go ahead and do that. You think they might look the other way? It's real easy for them to look the other way when they're making a lot of money like that. Surgeons tend to overtreat people. Third simple fact, the more extreme the surgery and the more cuts involved, the more money a surgeon makes. That's another scary fact if you think about that. Because what it means is that surgeons tend to develop procedures and operations that involve excessive butchering. And speaking of excessive butchering, we're going to look now at four shocking cancer surgeries. The first one's called the Commando. The second, the Whipple. Number three is called Total Exenteration. And number four is called the Hemicorporectomy. So the commando was performed on patients for tongue cancer and involved the removal of a patient's entire mandible or jaw. So imagine that. You got cancer on your tongue and a surgeon wants to perform a procedure and takes off your entire jaw. Good luck chewing. Good luck speaking. Good luck looking anything like you did before. Talk about a life-destroying surgery. According to one surgeon, the commando derived its wide acceptance and popularity from the fact that it brought to mind the slashing attack of the World War I commandos. The Whipple. 
The Whipple was a procedure for the treatment of pancreatic cancer developed by President of the American Surgical Association and Clinical Director at, you guessed it, Memorial Hospital, Dr. Alan Oldfather Whipple. This surgery involved the removal of many organs adjacent to the affected gland on the theory that they might be harboring nests of cancer cells. So yeah, you got cancer in your pancreas, oh, we're just going to start ripping out a whole bunch of organs just to make sure we got it. Needless to say, this did not cure cancer and the survival rate, the prognosis was not good. <laughs> your chance of being alive in like five years was at most 5%. Total exenteration. In 1948, Dr. Alexander Brunschwig from Memorial Hospital invented an operation called total exenteration, which involved the removal of the following body parts, the rectum, the stomach, the bladder, part of the liver, the ureter, all internal reproductive organs, the pelvic floor and wall, the pancreas, the spleen, the colon, and many blood vessels. In a New York Times article dated April 8, 1969, Brunschwig himself called the operation a brutal and cruel procedure. And last but not least, the hemicorporectomy. The ultimate operation was the hemicorporectomy, which was literally the removal of half the body. The hemicorporectomy was developed for the treatment of bladder or pelvic malignancy by Theodore Miller, another Memorial Hospital surgeon, and involved the amputation of everything below the pelvis. Not surprisingly, many patients chose death over submitting to Miller's operation. Now, needless to say, this did not cure cancer. None of these cured cancer. And amazingly, all of those surgeries are still being performed today. They're still on the menu. You can look it up. Look up any of those surgeries. You'll see that they're being performed in recent years. That's medical madness. I'm going to go back, actually. So there you go. There are four shocking cancer surgeries, none of which cured cancer. And the most shocking part of all is this. All of those surgeries are still being performed to this day. Yes, none have been banned and they are still on the menu. This is medical madness. How do we end this medical madness? Well, in 2018, I had the pleasure of interviewing Australian surgeon Ian Harris, author of the book, Surgery, The Ultimate Placebo. At the end of the interview, I asked him his most important message that he'd like everybody in the world to know. And he said, the effectiveness of medicine is overestimated by those who are making the decisions and the harms are underestimated. The doctors that sell are overestimating the benefits and underestimating the harms. The way to correct that is to make doctors be more scientific about what they do and also to educate the public to be more scientific about what they will have done to them. Don't be afraid to look up the evidence. Ask your doctor questions. The simplest question of all, and it sounds dumb, but so many unnecessary procedures could have been saved by asking this single question. What evidence do you have that doing this procedure to me is better than not doing it to me? Always ask that to your doctor. It's like, yes, I think we will always have people with knives trying to take your money, whether it's a medical industry surgeon or somebody in the street. But we have to be better customers. That's the moral of the story. The moment we start questioning, and saying no when there's no evidence to a surgery, that service disappears. That's the beauty of the free market. If you like what I'm doing and want to support my work, you can buy an exclusive end-all disease red light therapy device. We've got the handheld device, the body light mini, and the full body light by going to endalldisease.com store. I've got three books that I've wrote, all bestsellers, one on red light therapy and two on cancer. If you want to check those out, go to endalldisease.com books. And for the show notes on this episode, and to sign up for our mailing list, go to endalldisease.com slash episode 7. Once again, I want to thank you for tuning in. We will see you in the next installment. And until then, goodbye and God bless.